Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Theresa May says there's no change in the government's position on public sector pay. That's despite a succession of ministers lining up to say that it's time to remove the 1% pay gap in England. Downing Street says it will listen to the recommendations of the various independent pay review bodies, but pay rises for millions of workers, including doctors, nurses and the armed forces, have already been fixed at 1% for the next year. Here's our economics editor, Kamal Ahmed. How are we doing at the top end? There are two stark figures at the heart of this battle over public sector pay. 1%, the pay cap imposed by the government for nurses, teachers, firefighters and the many other public sector workers, and 2.9%, the rate at which prices are rising, inflation. For the 5 million people this affects, their real incomes are falling. Alan Daly is a firefighter from Oxfordshire, like so many others, weary of the living standards squeeze. Our fires don't expect to be rich, but they don't expect to, expect to go and ask for handouts. I hear it time and time again, oh, they've got second jobs. Yes, some do have second jobs because they have to put food on the table. The pressure is growing. Cabinet heavyweights are lining up to call for a rethink on the pay cap, much to the irritation of the Treasury, which says balancing the books is still a vital part of the government's economic policy. Paying for public sector workers is one of the biggest things that the government does. We spend £180 billion a year on the doctors and nurses and teachers and policemen and so on. So each extra 1% on that big number itself costs quite a lot. This is the public sector pay challenge. Whilst pay in the public sector has been capped at 1%, in the private sector, average increases are now running at 3.3%. This is leading to those recruitment problems. The private sector is simply becoming more attractive. And then there is the cost of any pay rise, and that could be as high as £1.5 billion for every 1% extra paid to the 5 million people employed in the public sector. Now, who pays for that? Well, here the Treasury says that money will either need to come from higher taxes, more borrowing or a better performing economy. As we have seen with the poor economic figures at the start of the year, relying on economic growth can be dangerous. But how would economists tackle the public sector pay challenge? It's perfectly straightforward to say you can raise taxes to pay for this. I think the barrier there is political. And we've had a government that for a very long time now has been saying we want to uh, at least level off public spending and not have any increases. We don't want to increase taxes, we'd rather give people tax cuts. And this is now um, two immovable objects crashing into each other. Clothes are going here. Whether it's the response to the Grenfell fire tragedy, the heightened terror risk, or today's public sector pay tensions, difficult choices on spending lie ahead. The government's position in Parliament is precarious, making every decision it makes politically and economically high risk. Kamal Ahmed, BBC News. Well, let's hear from our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, who's at uh, Westminster for us this evening. Uh, Laura, whatever happened to, to cabinet unity? It seems as every day another minister comes along and expresses his or her views. Well, George, there aren't many wallflowers around this place. There rarely are. But normally there is a sense of discipline where cabinet ministers will have big rows, discussions about things in private, but in public they all stick to the same line. Well, that is not the case on this issue, but there's much more discussion of this going on than we've seen over the airways in the last few days. Privately, there are plenty of ministers who are saying they want to see the cap lifted. They want to lift the lid on the pay limits on millions of nurses, teachers, police officers and the rest of the public sector. But don't let those public pronouncements in the last couple of days make you think that there aren't plenty who are opposite arguing in the opposite direction. One minister said to me today it would be utter madness just to ditch the cap in the confusing aftermath of an election because it is part of the policy, the fiscal framework, if you like, to give the technical term that the government have built up with care over recent years. There are clashing opinions on this and the government is not at the stage of reaching a decision. And if you like, they've had the easier first part of the conversation, which is people accepting that many public 
public sector workers feel, frankly, they are long overdue a pay rise, but they're yet really to get into digging in to the second part of the conversation. If they make a political decision to do this, what do they cut instead? Or which taxes would they increase to pay for it? Laura, thank you very much. Downing Street has insisted there will not be a change of heart over public sector pay as more high-profile Conservatives join calls to lift the 1% cap on annual pay rises. Policing Minister Nick Hurd told MPs that paying frontline workers fairly was under active discussion. Earlier, the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson claimed wages could be boosted without increasing taxes. Our correspondent Siobhan Kennedy has been to the Midlands where she's been talking to public sector workers struggling to manage. Talk of a public sector pay rise couldn't come soon enough for Debbie Ferris, a teaching assistant at a special needs school in Smethwick in the West Midlands. A single mum with two children, she says rising costs for her mortgage and weekly shop means she's struggling to make ends meet. It could be so easy for me to just say, I can't do this job anymore because the responsibility is too much and go and work in retail or go and work for a supermarket or I love my job and I don't want to give that up just because I have to be mindful and worry mm. about money all the time. Debbie's frustration is echoed by Britain's five million public sector workers. They want the 1% cap on their pay to be lifted, an argument government ministers are finding it harder to ignore. The government would say that, you know, we're still recovering from the financial crisis, that we have to keep our belts tight. But it's always the public sector, isn't it, that we have that they have to keep tight. Yeah, it's always, it's always, it's always the public sector that they have to keep tight. And with a, I don't know, I just, we're like the manpower of the country. It's the wrong people to, to pull tight. And we have pulled tight, we've pulled tight for six to seven years now. The Foreign Secretary seems to agree. Has the government been underpaying nurses and teachers, Foreign Secretary? Apparently the latest cabinet minister to support the idea of a better deal for public sector pay, provided it doesn't cause too much strain on government coffers. He joins other senior cabinet colleagues also calling for a relaxation on pay for teachers, nurses and the armed forces. And today, a hint, perhaps, in the Commons from the policing minister, Nick Hurd, that change could be coming. We want to make sure uh, that frontline public service workers, including the police, are paid fairly for their work. The minister said how they would do that was under what he called active discussion. Downing Street has insisted today that its policy has not changed and said it was listening to the bodies that make recommendations over public sector pay. But the government knows any move to lift the cap will cost it billions of pounds. And that poses a real challenge for the Chancellor, Philip Hammond. With very little headroom left for increased borrowing, that only really leaves him with one choice to raise money, and that's to raise taxes. And the last time he did that led to an almost immediate U-turn. Anti-austerity protesters hit the streets at the weekend, emboldened by a weakened government and an opposition demanding the public sector pay cap is scrapped. But one former chancellor said austerity couldn't and shouldn't just be switched off. It's all very well to say people are tired of it. Um, this isn't like repeats on television that people have just got bored of seeing the program over and over again. We're talking about a serious issue here. Austerity, which is a misleading world, we're just talking about living within one's own means. It isn't a choice, it's something you have to do. But back in Smethwick, that message is a tough sell to people like council worker Sarah James. As long as I can put food in my stomach, that's, that's great. There are people who come to us that are having to rely on food banks. That's happening with a lot of my colleagues as well, especially the local. That Yeah, I mean, some of our cleaners and things, they, they're having to rely on food banks. And it's, it's no way someone should live. I mean, we've got Theresa May keeps telling us we're doing a great job. She needs to show that appreciation in more than empty words. Sarah's union, the GMB, estimates that the average public sector worker has lost £9,000 in real terms since the pay cap was introduced. And with private sector workers also feeling the pinch as inflation rises, the Chancellor will find himself with increasingly difficult decisions ahead.
Shabal and Kenny there reporting from the Midlands. Well, our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is in the House of Commons. Gary, with minister after minister saying what they think about this, it seems a bit of a free-for-all. Where is fiscal and cabinet discipline in all this? It's a pretty odd state of affairs, isn't it? What seems to be happening is you are getting some ministers who I think it's fair to say are chancing their arm and playing to the gallery. You're getting some, and I've spoken to them, who say, do you know what, I actually got a bit of clearance from number 10 before I went out and started talking about relaxing uh, public sector pay. Uh, you then hear voices from around the Treasury uh, slightly in horror about that because Philip Hammond is absolutely adamant that until his cabinet colleagues can come up with some way of cutting the public sector that could pay for this, a magnificent new growth strategy which could pay for it, or tax hikes that he could get through the House of Commons, well, then they should uh, probably stay stum. And as Siobhan was saying, the last time he tried to get a tax rise through didn't go exactly well with the national insurance uh, charge rises. And the chances of doing that in a minority uh, government, most people are saying, are virtually nil. Well, what people really want to know watching this program, watching you, uh, is, especially their public sector workers, is when can they actually expect to see a pay rise? Well, it might not be immediate. Uh, there are a couple of uh, pay review uh, body reports still in the system waiting to come out, but they were started, all the work on them was done under the 1% pay cap auspices. So they're not likely to come up with anything a hell of a lot more generous than the ones that you've already seen earlier in the year. The suspicion must be that there won't be much movement on public sector pay until probably April of 2018, those pay packets that start then. And even then, how much will you actually get? Look at the numbers when they were costed for uh, putting up public sector pay in line with inflation. And you're talking about end of parliament costs about nine billion a year is every expectation that if they do move on this the government will move a lot lower than that and it could be that after an awful lot of headlines public sector workers don't see an awful lot of new money after tax in their pockets oh dear gary gibbon thanks very much indeed john well i'm joined now by victoria davy a nurse from yorkshire indeed she's been a nurse at york hospital for 26 years she challenged Theresa May during the general election campaign over nurses' pay. Now, uh, Victoria, I, I just wonder, first of all, did you feel the Prime Minister understood your point and, and was sympathetic to it? No, I don't. She didn't. My actual question was whether she thought the nurses would vote for her in light of the 1% pay cap, and that wasn't answered at all. And did I feel she was sympathetic? No, not really. What, I mean, do you want to see? I mean, if, 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 you, if you could talk to Mrs May now and say, this is what we need, what would you say? I think we need some kind of reflection to show that we're actually appreciated. I think, obviously, we need to have some kind of pay rise to be in line with everyone else and, and to, to make people's lives a bit easier. But I think people just want appreciation on a personal level for the job that they're doing. And it just seems like that isn't there at all at the moment. But I believe you, you, your family is really struggling, that in fact you feel that, that you can't really manage on what you're getting. I think, I think I'm probably luckier than some people because obviously I've worked there a long time um, and my pay will be higher than a lot of people starting out and their futures are probably very bleak and those will be the ones that end up leaving. What about other things within the, the nursing arena? Do, do you feel any sense of what people describe as the stresses and tensions within the health service as to what can be provided? I think there are a lot of stresses at the moment and I think staffing is always an issue and will continue to be an issue but then you need to have something to make people want to stay and want to come in the first place and at the moment that's probably what's lacking. I mean your hospital where you've been so long is a kind of community probably people have, other people have been they there have, quite a long yeah, time too. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering how this morale affects the whole community where you're working. I think the morale where I am actually at the moment is not too bad. I think because, like you say, a lot of people have been there for a long time, so it is very much a community. And in that way, people help each other to carry on. But I think for people starting out that maybe don't have that connection, that it's really very hard. Victoria David, thank you very much indeed. And you'll be interested to listen to our next... Um, uh, interviewee because she's in Westminster now, the Conservative MP Sarah Wollaston, a former GP 
Well, I suppose you're still a GP, even if you're not really particularly practicing. But I wonder how you would answer uh, what uh, Victoria asked. Well, I think it is absolutely essential that we look at increasing public sector pay. We've seen worrying figures out from the Nursing and Midwifery Council today showing the number of registrants falling for the first time. And although there are many factors for that, there's no doubt that, that pay pays a role, particularly when we look at a fiercely competitive international market and the gap that's growing between public sector pay and nursing and those who are working in, uh, in other professions because they have very transferable skills and we cannot afford to lose, lose these people um, from the workforce. So I think that the argument is there that pay is now having an impact on recruitment, retention and morale and we need to take that very seriously. But did you hear the drip, drip, drip of ministers saying, come on, time, time to lift the, lift the, the, the bar? Um, are you convinced perhaps that there is a, a movement going on inside the cabinet yes. to lift it? And then if you are, what, what of Philip Hammond? Well, I think it's, in my mind, I think it's a question of when rather than if, and the discussion needs to now focus on how we're going to pay for this, because if we simply fund this out of increased borrowing, all we're doing is shifting that onto the next generation to pay for. So I think what we now need is a, a very serious discussion about how we pay for this. And unfortunately, because of the way manifestos now work, that any party that puts in any proposals to increase any form of taxation gets published in, in, in the polls, uh, in, in the ballot box rather, um, I think it really is time for us to see cross-party working on this because it's not just about public sector pay, it's about that wider piece of increasing funding to the public sector because if all the funds that we have are then diverted into public sector pay then we'll see an impact on services so we need a much wider look at how we're going to sustainably fund our public services in the long term and that means that all of us are going to end up having to pay a little bit more because the alternative is that we just shift this onto the next generation and expect them to, to pick up the tab and so I think cross-party working that's what the public want to see I think in a hung parliament it's not politicians at each other's throats but politicians working constructively together to come up with a real way that we're going to fund mm. this well now Gary Gibbon mentioned the pay review body for example coming in at 1% and and I think a lot of people will be shocked that it's possible for the government to simply say to a body which is actually employed to say what the real need is is only allowed to say the real need is what you say 1% and, of course, if you look at the recommendations from the NHS pay review body and look at what they said about that, uh, they were very clear. Their underlying message was, look, pay is having an impact on recruitment, retention and morale. So I think what we now need is the Treasury to be able to relax that cap because you can't say you're listening to the pay review body on the one hand and not listen to that underlying message that they need it to go above 1%. So I say I think the, the momentum is building from across the party, not just within cabinet, but across the back benches. That we really need to listen to the message from the electorate that we heard loud and clear during the election campaign. But what we must do is have sensible discussions about how we're going to fund it, because otherwise we'll just be trapped in this endless round of, of bickering between parties, rather than actually sitting down and saying, how do we do this fairly? Right, well, how do we do it fairly and across generations as well? A very brief final question. You were. Uh running the Health Select Committee. Are you going to go back on it? Do you want to run it again? Well, uh, the Select Committee chairs are voted in by the entire House of Commons and those elections will take place in two weeks' time. I shall put my name forward, but it'll be up to the House of Commons to decide who, okay. who they elect. Dr Sarah Williston, thank, thank you. you very much indeed for being with us. Victoria Davey, um, your reaction? I mean, there is a sense there that certainly she, who's in a pretty good position, uh, Dr Williston, um, thinks the movement is in hand. Yeah, and I mean, I agree with what she says. You've, you can't just find the money from somewhere. You've got to find a way of, of funding it and funding it in a way that works. And I appreciate what she says. I feel that she kind of gave a more empathetic answer and that was what I was looking for in the first place. Victoria Davy, thank you very much thank for you. coming in. Now, if you've been managing to keep up with the recent twists and turns surrounding the government's austerity policy, well, there were yet more to track today. The policing minister, Nick Hurd, became the latest senior Tory to signal there could be some relaxation of the public sector pay cap for what he called frontline workers. But then Downing Street apparently poured cold water on any thoughts that changes might be afoot. It insisted, again 
that nothing has changed. Remember that phrase, perhaps, in public sector pay policy. Public sector workers who've put up with years of pay restraint are now having to put up with considerable pay confusion. Official government policy limits their pay increases to 1%, yet today the police minister was just the latest to hint that cap could be lifted. In relation to police pay, let me, let me be very clear. Uh, we want to make sure uh, that frontline public service workers, including the police, are paid fairly for their work. The police have endured a two-year pay freeze, followed by several years of the 1% cap. So a police sergeant of Louis McCoy's experience earns around £42,000 a year, a 15% real terms cut since 2010, says the Police Federation, leaving a sergeant like Louis £6,300 worse off than they would have been. We've seen gas bills go up, electricity bills go up, petrol go up, cost of living and food go up, yet yeah, our wages haven't gone up to keep up with that inflation, to keep up with the rising cost of living. Even the Foreign Secretary has backed more money for public workers, despite this not being government policy. Old Treasury hands think this is unhelpful. It's very easy for people to court popularity, going in front of a television screen, giving an interview and saying, we want more, we want more. These are matters that ought to be decided in private, in government. And the government, the way it's going about things at the moment, is in danger of looking as though it's in chaos. But public sector workers say people are leaving their professions. As a teacher with 30 years experience in London, Kim earns nearly £47,000. But teachers say their pay is worth 15% less since 2010, the equivalent of a £7,000 cut for Kim. Yet Kim is most worried about the effect on young teachers in her area. If they're not leaving London to teach elsewhere, they're leaving teaching because they can get a better pay package in some other job. Today, a Downing Street spokesman insisted public pay policy had not changed. Yet so many ministers have now said government would listen to the pay review bodies who make recommendations on public pay, that it's hard to believe it's not about to change, which in turn creates a problem for number 11. How to pay for it? We spend an awful lot paying teachers and doctors and nurses and the armed forces and so on, about £180 billion pounds a year. So 1% of £180 billion is knocking on for £2 billion pounds for every 1%. So if you're going to be increasing at 3% a year, which is roughly where inflation is, and not 1%, that's a lot of billions of pounds over the next few years. You're going to scrap the pay cap, Chancellor? Hello, good evening. Money the Chancellor would have to find from cuts elsewhere, even more borrowing, or of course, tax rises. Carl Dinan, News at 10, Westminster. Well, the pay cap was also blamed today for another potential crisis threatening the NHS in England. For the first time, more nurses and midwives are leaving the profession than joining it. The Royal College of Nursing estimates that there are 40,000 vacant nursing positions in England alone. It's six years since Carey qualified as a nurse, but paying the bills seems to get harder by the week. I work so hard in the job that I do, taking care of other people's families, but I also find it really hard in the fact when I have to say to my own family, you know, we can't do this because we just don't have the money. She hasn't had a holiday in three years, but it's her patients' welfare that worries her most. I see nurses in tears because they're being pushed to their limits um, to provide care with inadequate staffing levels on the ground. Unsafe staffing levels were meant to have been addressed after the scandal at Mid Staffs Hospital over a decade ago. New nurse to patient ratios were introduced, but they depend on enough staff being available. Figures show that from 2012 to 2016, the amount of nurses and midwives joining the register was greater than the numbers leaving. But for the first time, that trend has now reversed, with the overall number registered in the UK falling by 1,783 in the 12 months up till March. And in the following two months alone, 3,264 nurses and midwives chose to leave the profession. The Department of Health insists the number of nurses on our wards has actually increased by 13,000 since 2010. But that's dwarfed by the number of nursing posts the NHS would like to fill, but can't. Right now, there are as many as 40,000 vacancies, just as demand's increasing. 
We're all getting older. We all have complex conditions. We need nurses in GP practices, in care homes, in hospitals. We need midwives. Unless we have sufficient number, that means we won't have people to care for us. That's a serious position to be in. And with bursaries for new nurses scrapped from September, it's hard to see how numbers can recover. Rachel Younger, News at 10, Gillingham. Well, our political editor, Robert Peston, joins me now. We saw the Chancellor off to make a speech tonight in Carl's piece. What has he had to say, crucially? So I think it's very important to understand what the split at the top of government is about when it comes to public sector pay. There is a broad consensus that if they could put up salaries for nurses and teachers, they would. As I said just the other day on this programme, the last thing they want is a strike of nurses, which may well happen in the autumn if there isn't a pay rise. The argument is about how you finance it. Now, we had Michael Gove and Boris Johnson, two very senior members of the government, suggesting that you could fund those pay increases by borrowing. And the Chancellor tonight has slapped them down. He said he wants a grown-up debate about this, which suggests they're not grown-ups. And he says you cannot, in his view, finance increases in consumption, current expenditure, through borrowing. And he's saying explicitly, if you want to pay more to public sector workers, taxes have to go up. And that means we all turn our attentions then to which taxes. So what is in his armoury, do you think, Robert? So, so let's be absolutely clear again. He is not at this stage saying there will definitely be these pay rises because, of course, there ha now has to be a debate about which taxes could actually get through Parliament. Now, in my view, if they put up taxes for all of us, income taxes, national insurance, it would not get through Parliament, OK? Because, you know, frankly, a lot of Tories would rebel and I suspect they would not get the backing of the opposition parties, it would split the Tory party. So they've got to do a backdoor tax rise. What, what, what might that be? Well, I suppose they could do what Labour were suggesting, which is not to cut corporation tax in the way that George Osborne promised. But again, that would be giving really a big win to the Labour Party because the Labour Party has been arguing that. So they're going to have to find something else. If I had to guess, they would do what they've done so many times in the past, and that is whack up the tax that people pay or, or reduce tax relief on our pension contributions. Watch this space. Thank you very much indeed. The debate over what replaces austerity is underway and public sector pay is at the heart of it. The 1% cap on pay rises remains for now, but there are those in government who want more pay for public workers paid for by tax rises, others who think we should borrow to pay them more, and presumably others who think the pay cap should stay for the next few years until the deficit is definitively slain. Well, the economic arguments are interesting, given that the deficit is not the problem it was. But the politics is even more interesting. Even among a certain class of deficit headbangers, the will for austerity is fading. And then there's the fact the debate about it within government is so public. A thousand firemen from all parts of the country head for Hyde Park past Marble Arch through the rain to publicise their demand for higher pay. Public sector pay has long been an issue and an emotive one. One claim for more money everybody supports except the powers that be is the nurses. And this, 2010, is when the latest vagaries affected public servants. The government is asking the public sector to accept a two-year pay freeze. That was then followed by a 1% cap on pay rises. Is it just more cuts, Chancellor? Year after year, who knew we'd still be talking about it in 2017? The problem is that in delivering spending cuts, each small-sounding 1% saved on public sector pay lops almost two billion off public spending. For ages, restraint seemed like easy money for the Exchequer. And there was a holy trinity of arguments in favour. One, back in 2010, the need to make savings was greater, with a deficit running at 10% of national income. Two, the justification was clearer as well. Public sector pay was running perhaps a little higher than equivalent private sector pay. And three, public sector workers had not seen their pensions as badly curtailed. In 2010, public sector pay was a relatively attractive thing to hold down, partly because it had done so much better than private sector pay in the years following the recession. And therefore, the government might have thought that it could suppress private, uh, public sector pay growth uh, without too much pain in terms of people leaving and getting jobs in the private sector. 
Now, all three of the trinity of arguments have diminished. The deficit is smaller. The public sector pay advantage over private sector workers has shrunk away and public sector pensions have been trimmed as well. So is Whitehall ready to declare austerity dead? Well, cautious economists may worry that the public sector only has two modes, tap shut or tap gushing. With urgency over the deficit gone, it won't be a careful easing of pay restraint on a case-by-case -case basis. No, it'll be a money rush. Doesn't have to happen, of course, but it takes strong leadership to stop it happening. And with minority government, we don't have strong leadership. Which is why it seems post-austerity politics has been unleashed in an ill-disciplined way. Let's not jump ahead of ourselves. The policy has not changed for now, but the talk has surely gone too far for the direction of travel to remain unchanged for long. Well, let's deal a little bit more on the politics there. Our political editor, Nick Watt, is with me. Um, Nick, just tell us a little more about the goings-on and the behind-the-scenes sort of cabinet machinations on this. Well, there is irritation in the Treasury bordering on fury that now we've had a third of the cabinet basically signalling that they want that 1% public uh, sector pay cap to be reviewed. I'm hearing talk that these ministers are virtue signalling. And what has happened to the constitutional principle that the Prime Minister is first among equals? It turns out all the cabinet think they are equal. Now, in a speech tonight, to the CBI, the Chancellor said that at the moment there is no change to the policy of striking what he called the right balance between being fair to our public servants and fair to those who pay for them. But he said the government is continually assessing that balance and in a sign of how complex he regards this is, he said that there should be a grown-up debate on how to fund public services, but he said the only way to do that sustainably in the long term is by growing the economy. Ah, grown-up debate. Why don't we have a childish debate for once? Um, do you think Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, do you think he can really do anything about this? Will he do anything about this? Well, this is a minority government and so it feels to me that the Chancellor may well act in his budget later this year and may even send out a signal in the run-up to that budget. Now, interestingly, in his speech tonight, he said that the spike in inflation due to currency depreciation has led to what he just called frustration over the stagnation in real pay growth. So I understand that there is a concern between the gap between that 1% pay cap and inflation, which is currently running at close to 3%. So I think what we could be looking at later this year is movement in that area by putting a link between inflation and public sector pay rise. Maybe not a real terms rise in pay, but what you could maybe see is perhaps you could have a rise in pay at 1% below the Consumer Prices Index. Nick, thank you very much indeed. Well, Kenneth Clark was Chancellor of the Exchequer between 1993 until 1997. Obviously, he's had a number of other senior cabinet roles where he spent money as well as dishing it out. But in his years at the Treasury, the deficit came down very substantially. Very good evening to you. Do you think there's an economic case at the moment for continuing with pay restraint in the public sector beyond, say, this year into extra years? Yes, I'm afraid there is until the economy shows signs of definitely... Uh, recovering from the current very serious slowdown. Uh, I, I mean, you, you've got to work out th th this. Now we are a minority government, but one that's intending to go on, what your aims are. And I assume we're going to carry on for two or three years. And I think we've got to deliver successful government, which at the end means we show we're competent, we have a reasonable economy, we've avoided going into recession, uh, we're getting near a reasonable Brexit deal, and we're achieving some reasonable growth. Now, if everybody's going to start giving into the lobby of the week, and this week it's public sector pay because it's the lobby trade, of the it, week it, in terms of like lobby of the day yeah, as opposed to lobby of the, 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 the vulnerable. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's suddenly the political bubble has got seized with this last two or three days because it's the public okay. sector trade unions conference season. It, but well, uh, well, you uh, may uh, say and this. And what you cannot do is give into that. The what would be disastrous at the moment to be quite silly but, economic but wait, policy wait, 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 wait. to start putting money in to fuel. A burst in pay in the public sector pursuing 
inflation. But you're making out that the case for public sector pay rises is just kind of weakness and stupidity. No, no, Actually, there are retention it. problems in the public sector, which mean trying to get decent workers, you have to pay them a little bit more. The, the public sector used to be paid more than the private sector. That's gone. You can't rely it's on that anymore. not quite gone, but in parts of the well, country, in, in they're still the, the most secure yeah, and desirable yeah. jobs you have. We, we, the, the nurses are being used as a... The nurses are so popular, so highly respected by me and other people, that you always put those on the front line if you're running a pay claim. Uh, 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 and we have a problem with nurses. The Brexit's called a devaluation which has made this country less attractive for foreign nurses to work in, and the Romanians have all gone back. Well, 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 but whatever anymore. the cause, whatever the cause... To do with the pay level. No, but whatever the cause, basic economics tells you if you're short of people, you pay a bit, pay a bit more to get them, it, it, and the that's what you The reason you're do. not retaining nurses is pay, but I don't think how much you're going to give. I mean, the politics are very bad. If the government gives in to this, uh, it won't get any credit for it. Uh, firstly, our opponents, the Labour Party, will say, it's not enough, uh, you've abandoned your cap, but we give more than that. And the newspapers and the political bubble will say, another defeat for May okay, so and, this is and very the Chancellor. Okay. They've all been defeated. Right, They've given the in. Argument. That's what happened to that very sensible decision on abortion for Northern Ireland women, which I'm sure Theresa May was extremely anxious to agree with, but it was portrayed as a defeat for her. Right. So, so you think the politics says you have to stand firm because... You've got to explain if, But way. responding to Labour's manifesto, which by all accounts was rather popular compared to yours... Responding to that by trying to sort of get halfway or match certain of the things isn't going to work. You have to explain why, in, if you're in government, you have to take tough, difficult decisions which are in the general public interest, including public servants, because you wish to keep right. a strong, growing, modern economy. We could, we could talk and just throwing ages. money about to make yourself more popular next week when it won't even succeed in doing that well, let, is a mistake. Let me ask you this. When you were Chancellor, you got the deficit down. It wasn't starting from such a high base. And you, 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 you took unpopular actions. You put up taxes yeah. and you cut spending. And you did them in about even measure. And that was a political choice. You could have weighed them up in different ways. But you thought, let's be a centrist government, we'll do a bit on, a bit on spending and a bit on taxes, or quite a bit on both. George Osborne's austerity was very different. It was 80%, in fact now more than 80%, on spending. He didn't put up taxes. You could quite reasonably say, it's gone too far on the public service side, we need to spend more, and we'll put up taxes to pay for it. But he took over from a, a very uh, high-taxing government. Okay. Uh, so the, the, he had constraints. You, you, what you have to do, what Philip has to do, is address the reality of the economic situation of the moment. Behind all this, somebody used earlier the phrase grown-up politics. If you're in government, unlike these other people f sailing around doing interviews and so on, you have to look at the reality. And what it's your duty to deliver is an economy which in two or three years' time is better than it was when you took what over. Does... The Labour Party howled at everything I did. When we reached the election, we were miles ahead of them in the opinion polls on the economy, and Tony Blair and Gordon Brown said they wouldn't change a jot what... of my spending and tax what... decisions. What do you think Philip Hammond means by grown-up conversation? Does that mean the conversation isn't grown-up at the moment? What addresses the extremely serious economic problems we face when we've slowed down right. very severely... But is it Brexit, not grown-up at the moment? Come on, make a cheap political the, the, point the, about... The, 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 <laughs> well, the, as far as the, the general political bubble, it's the politicians as much as the media, it's not grown-up at all. The, the, the fact is Brexit's making us poorer. Uh, it has actually stimulated uh, a devaluation and inflation and living standards are dropping, uh, uncertainty is stopping investment, we're the slowest growing economy, and it's, it's maybe temporary. Look, it's interesting I that the Brexiteers Philip, I think are the Philip, ones, the Brexiteers, Gove and Johnson, are the two who've been out in the last 24 hours suggesting, you know, that the, the, the public sector pay needs well, to be Well, I eased. think, with great respect, I think your clips span. Uh, what Michael said. I, I'm delighted. Do you think so? Do you, think so? you don't think I'm, Michael Gove... You, you cut that... out all the stuff where he talked about fiscal discipline. And you're not alone. Everybody else is doing that. The, 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 I'm delighted to see Cabinet Ministers going out and being allowed, let out of the cupboard, being allowed to do what you, Cabinet Ministers good. should this do, good. and go out and talk about politics and defend their policies, explain why they're doing things. I think Philip should do more of it. I think Theresa should. And go back to sensible debate. All this 
PR rubbish about the grid and going out and giving <laughs> slogans. We're getting rid of all that. So hang on, so, hang on. Hang on. I want to be clear. They're new at it. They need, they need some practice. Basically, and they'll find they'll get spun to make mischief. But basically, Goes, you're saying those comments are perfectly all right. You're basically saying it's not a cabinet of ill discipline. We should, we, or at least we shouldn't worry if it is. It's sort of authentic. It's, and no, it's not as ill discipline as you're right. making it seem. You, uh, 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 and I think they will. Will uh, they, they need to be reminded that they've all got to concentrate on the serious job in hand because the whole cabinet will go down if they. Don't just respond to populist urges of the weak in question and make a mess of the economy uh, when people look so back in two or three years very time. Very interesting. And you make one. a mess of the economy if you pour money into starting wage inflation, the bank will have to raise interest rates, you will cast serious doubts on our economic you future. Cast, you cast you the, 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 the public sector pay issue with populism, and we, you know, which is a word bandied around a lot, by, including by me. Ah, you, and you, 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 see it, you see it as all part of one and the same. It's this week's, yeah. it's this week's media right. campaign. Last one. The, the, the nurses and the doctors settle for 1% without any particular demur two months they, ago. They, 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 so they, sudden, they, suddenly, they may well it's not... the great passionate cause of the day You'll be stirring shortly them. after they've settled. Last for it. one. You famously called Theresa May a bloody difficult woman. Yeah. She took that as a badge of honour and was, was quoting it. Do you still think I've... she's a bloody difficult woman or do you think she's a bit of a pushover? She, need, she needs to be difficult. I hope is, she, she... is she or is she a pushover? She well, gave, more to, proves... the, uh, but what I, what gave I... more to the DUP than what, she what intended. What I hope is she proves to be a bloody difficult woman. Say, look, we have a serious task of government Is she here. proving to be Let one? us follow grown-up politics, we're getting stuck in that cliché, uh, let us understand we have an economic difficulty, we do not want to be left behind by the developed world, we have a lot of tough challenges, we're not suddenly throwing money about so we can imitate the Labour Party and say we're giving everybody a pay rise. You'll set off private sector pay rises, you'll set off a rise in interest rates and you'll cause another blow to confidence and you'll cause further slowdown in Ken the economy. Clark, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I've been